we gather to get together today as a family in faith to celebrate the life and the ministry among us of one Mary Kisner. You may not know the story, but Mary came to us in sort of a serendipitous way. Early on, after our visioning process that resulted in the document that you all know as Vision 2020, we had one of our first efforts at becoming a real center for excellence in worship and music, and we hosted the composer and arranger, organist supreme David Hurd. Now, David taught at General Theological Seminary for many years, had recently retired, and it was interesting that we were able to bring him here and so we had a whole day of other workshops, choir workshops, and a lot of other things planned. And Mary came to us actually as one of those facilitators in one of those workshops that nobody signed up for. So she was examining the document that we had placed in uh, uh, the parish hall that had all of the summaries of all the things we wanted to do. And I went to her, and I had known Mary for quite some time, as we were both priests in the Diocese of Central Pennsylvania, and I had been in the bishop's office, and we had run into each other from time to time at clergy conferences and so on, and it was a delight to see her. I was so happy that she agreed to do the workshop in the first place. But it was great just to have a, be able to give a chat with her, because she wasn't busy. And she was looking at the bulletin board that had all that information on it, and I said to her, how's retire? No, I didn't say that. I said, what are you up to these days? And she looked at me and said, well, I'm about to retire. And without thinking, I said, you want a job? <laughs> and to my surprise, she said, maybe. And we started having conversations about it immediately talked a few times on the phone, we met, and shortly thereafter she was named assisting priest for children, youth, and young adults, which got changed over the years to children and family ministries. And she's been with us ever since. She and her husband Francis decided that they would move, take up residence in a permanent way, purchasing a home here in Lebanon, Remodeling it? Is it done? Never. It's on its way, though, pretty much. The important parts are done. I think the kitchen's done, finally. You know how those things go. But in the course of that time, Mary stood among us as one who taught as Jesus taught. There's a document that was written by the Roman Catholic bishops of the United States way back in 1972. And it was titled, To Teach as Jesus Taught. And I choose that title this morning because those of us who have come to know Mary and those of you who have come to know and to love her as I do, know that she exemplifies the teaching ministry of Jesus in spades. That's one of the things about Jesus' work. We tend to want to focus on Jesus as being the supreme God, the Son of God, with all of these marvelous powers, being able to raise the dead and heal the sick and multiply loaves and fishes and all that sort of stuff. But you know, when you read the scriptures, you find out very quickly that that's a very, very small part of what Jesus did. In fact, the titles that the people who knew Jesus when he walked on this earth, the titles that they gave to him were things like rabbi teacher, even good teacher, which is a special kind of meaning 
in the language of Jesus' time. Teacher. The teaching ministry of Jesus, even though we prefer to know him more as a healer and a miracle worker, it is the teaching ministry of Jesus that has had an impact on the world to this very day that changed cultures, that changed history. There have been many miracle workers, many magicians, many people who can do great works, but none of them are remembered like this Jesus of Nazareth. And it's not because of the great things that Jesus did, but because of the marvelous teaching that he gave us. You heard in the gospel lesson today his closest associates, and in fact, he uses the word himself. He says, if you would be my follower, if you would be my disciple. And who is a disciple, after all, other than a student? Because the word disciple derives from the Latin word, which is just that, to learn and to teach. When we enter higher education, you are asked what discipline you would like to go into. It isn't about being strict. It's about what field of study do you want to undertake. And so when Jesus gives a name to those who would follow him, in the Gospels, they are called disciples. They are called teachers. They are called followers. And so, for us to teach, as Jesus did, is actually to take the words that he gave us in these marvelous passages and allow them to filter down into our innermost being and there to embody the teaching of Jesus. So we are not only learning from Jesus, but by taking his words to heart and following and being his disciples, we are becoming as Jesus was. Jesus did not only teach by his words. That's where we make the mistake because we find that the Gospels are filled with these healing stories and these working of miracles and those stories take up a lot of words. But Jesus' teaching was less about the words that he spoke and more about the life that he lived. A life that is filled with love and sacrifice and truth. A love of service, a love and a life for others. If we need to find the core teaching of Jesus, there it is. And whenever Jesus taught, his teaching style was filled with compassion, with being able to sort of put himself in the heart and mind of the ones that he was teaching and to teach them in ways that they could understand because he got down to the core of those things that were important in our human lives. And the most important thing about that is our understanding of who we are. And it isn't that that Jesus reaches out most often with his teaching to sinners, to those who live at the margins of society, to those whose hearts have been broken by others and by the world. It is there that his teachings become real. They become visceral. They take on bodies. Jesus' teaching about love is not simply about nice. Jesus' teaching about love 
is to nurture the well-being of each and every person, the whole person, not just their mind, but their hearts and their souls. And so it is that the church, we, the body of Christ, we are called to inform and to form young people in a way that not only gives them something for their minds, but helps them to foster real and abiding attitudes of love and acceptance, especially for those who are different from us. How can we better reflect Christ's love in our teaching and in our everyday lives? That's what Mary came to do. She came to tell stories. It's true. She's a master storyteller. She's even got a title and a certificate to say so. But those stories were about Jesus. And each and every one of them reaches into our heart, into our mind, and into our lives. Just at the end of last term, we had an opportunity to hear the children, the young people that she has touched, tell their stories, the stories of the scriptures. And I can tell you, they tell them better than I can. All because of Mary. One of the things that we don't often think about is that one of the ways in which Jesus taught was in community, in solidarity with one another. He often taught among crowds of people. We heard it today. He's talking to his closest associates and he's having his little argument with Peter and then he turns around and he says to everybody around, listen to me. whether it is with his closest associates, his disciples, or with larger crowds, he's always involved in a dialogue with them, wondering what they're thinking. We don't really hear that so much in the text of the gospel, but you can see it in the words, and you can see it in the way he responds to people. He doesn't teach them as some lofty professor from a high lectern, but is down there among them, talking with them, understanding them, and then giving them the word of God in a way that they can carry away. And it's not just the way Jesus taught, but he taught in this way to show us that that's the way we must teach. That when we want people to follow Jesus, we ourselves must be part of that community. We ourselves must work together to do this. We ourselves must always band together. It isn't simply someone else's responsibility. It isn't just Mother Mary's responsibility or Father David's responsibility or the religion teacher's responsibility. It is our responsibility to teach a hungry and waiting world about Jesus about the one who can bring salvation and healing and most importantly, wholeness to our broken humanity. We are a community not only of listeners, but of learners. We must work together to create environments where everyone Everyone, young and old alike, are not only willing, but encouraged and invited to grow in faith, to grow in love. Jesus did not only teach with love in a community, but Jesus taught to transform us, to change our lives, to change the lives of those who heard him, not simply fill their minds with a new philosophy. 
he challenged his disciples and he challenges you and me today to rethink our values, to see where we are or are not living justly and walking in the ways of God's righteousness, God's justice. Just last week, we spent a lot of time thinking on those things. And it's not over. I pray that that was just the beginning. That we continually and constantly look at ourselves and ask ourselves the question, how would Jesus do this? Oh, not in some sort of marketing scheme where we're wearing little bracelets that ask WWJD, what would Jesus do? But we take to heart the deep teachings of Jesus, the difficult teachings of Jesus, as we heard today. Christian formation is not merely educating minds. It is not simply to learn information. It is about our moral and spiritual growth so that we can all begin to align ourselves with the will of God. That is the challenge. To teach as Jesus did teaches us that ultimately, it is not about us. That's what Jesus means when he said, if you would be my disciple, if you would follow me, you must be willing to take up your cross and possibly to lose your life that others may live. Our efforts at Christian formation, then, in our parish must inspire real change, real transformation, not only in ourselves, but in the community in which we live. We must create spaces where people are encouraged to live out the gospel message that Jesus taught us in practical and everyday ways. It isn't enough to know our Bible. We must live it. And that is the challenge. But Jesus' model of teaching through love, by inspiring us to do it together in community and to change ourselves for the sake of the kingdom of God, these serve as the foundation of true Christian formation. And these things are the values that I am happy and proud to say that Mother Mary Kisner has given us in these several years, given us an example, as Jesus did, of what it means to be a true disciple. And so, now that she's, as I like to say, retiring, retiring, that she, in a sense, leaves this to us. Trust me, I've been searching, searching for someone to help us. God hasn't sent that person here yet, but I have every confidence that as Mary was sent to us, we too will find the person we need. You've seen in the bulletin a prayer for discernment about this very thing for weeks, and I hope you've been praying that because prayer is powerful. And if you're not praying it, pray it now and pray it every day for the next weeks because we, as a community, are in need. We now have a giant hole in our heart. Sorry, Mary. I do. You don't know what it's like being a priest being alone in a community. To have another priest colleague is marvelous. And this, this woman with her compassion, with the way that she understood human hearts, 
would come into my office and look at me and said, sit down and say, all right, what's going on? That's as much teaching and as much the ministry of Jesus as anything she said in a classroom. Because by doing that, she changed me. Increased my compassion. Opened up my vision. She is my teacher. So friends, while we bid a sort of farewell, because she's not really going anywhere, she just got a lot more freedom. She and Francis will remain brothers and sisters with us in this parish. And from time to time, she will occupy this pulpit as she has before. But not because I told her to, but because she wanted to. She will offer her gifts as all of you are asked to offer your gifts as we form this community we call St. Luke's. As we change and transform our hearts in the manner of Jesus. As we seek to teach the world as Jesus taught. And so it is a bittersweet moment when we celebrate these things but also an exciting moment, new opportunities, new ways of looking at things, new ways of seeing new people, largely because of what she has done among us. In that, she already, don't take this the wrong way, is one of the great cloud of witnesses we use that phrase for the people who've gone to God already. But we are witnesses to one another of the love of Jesus among us. We are a great cloud. And that cloud is not some computer somewhere far away, but is right here, right now, in this place, at this time. God is calling us to a new adventure. What's on the other side? I have no idea. But we will do this together. And we will do it in love. And we will do it so that the transforming grace of God is seen among us by all who see us.